Hello there, my RPG lovers, and welcome to another video. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Genre-defining games are obviously rare, but when they come out, it won't take long until other studios try similar ideas, mechanics, or whatever makes that genre-defining game successful. But of course, there is a line that you should not cross, otherwise you're risking to make a blatant copy. Developing the game by using the same formula is usually acceptable, as long as you try to improve it in a way or just add a unique twist to it. That's exactly what pushed the gaming industry forward for all these years. Unfortunately, some publishers like Warner Brothers are totally oblivious to this idea, which they showed by securing a pattern for Nemesis System from Middle Earth games. It's kinda ironic, because that's pretty much the only unique feature in Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War. 90% of everything else is pulled from Batman and Assassin's Creed games, not to mention the most famous fantasy setting that you're using for the game's universe. Just imagine for a second that Blizzard did something similar when Diablo started to gain on popularity back in the day. There is a big possibility that we wouldn't get to see some great action RPGs like Divine Divinity, Path of Exile, Torchlight, Titan Quest or Grim Dawn. You know what else is grim? Browsing the internet in 2021 without using a VPN. Surfshark is a virtual private network which allows you to safely browse the internet without compromising your private information. Before you start downloading that questionable JRPG on Steam, just remember that someone is probably watching and quietly judging you. Surfshark offers you a bunch of different servers to connect to, allowing you to access the internet as if you were in another country. Besides from completely protecting your information, using a VPN gives you a lot more benefits. Streaming platforms like Netflix will allow you to watch exclusive TV shows and movies that were previously not available in your country. That's just one of the quick examples, but basically any form of censorship on the internet can be avoided with one press of a button. Never again you have to deal with that not available in your country annotation. Download Surfshark today and use my code that you see on the screen to get 83% discount and 3 extra months for free. You don't have to reinvent the wheel in order to significantly improve the existing formula that is proven to work. A unique concept that sounds good on paper and more importantly that works in practice is all what you need. Simple, right? The ability to mix two masteries in Grim Dawn is one of the most straightforward examples of this. But we can't start talking about that before we mention where it all started. The whole gameplay skeleton which Grim Dawn uses today dates back from 2006. Titan Quest was the most innovative Diablo-like action RPG that came out since, well, Diablo 2. The Greek mythology setting was the first thing that drew me into this game, but the thing that kept me playing for years was the unique character progression system. And it's kind of funny because the first time I played this game and reached level 8, where you get to choose the second mastery for your character, I thought the game glitched out because I already selected my mastery at level 2. Only soon to realize that's actually what the gameplay is all about, mixing two classes or masteries as the game calls them. My PTSD kicked in because I started to imagine all the possible combinations and different builds to play. Sadly, only a couple of years after Titan Quest released, Iron Lore Entertainment had to close down because of the inability to secure funding for the next project. But a new studio emerged from all this mess, founded by a couple of former members of Iron Lore. Grim Dawn was not supposed to be the first game from Crate Entertainment. A game called Black Legion was in the middle of the development process between the closure of Iron Lore and the beginning of Crate Entertainment. It was also supposed to be a very similar game to Titan Quest. But unfortunately, that never happened and we don't have a lot of info about this project. If you played Grim Dawn, the name Black Legion probably sounds familiar. That's because there is a faction called Black Legion in Grim Dawn, which we can only assume is inspired by some parts of the unfinished game with the same name. And call me crazy, but I see a lot of similarities between this concept design and some of the armor sets from Black Legion in Grim Dawn. Now here's the thing. In the middle of writing this part of the script, I decided to try and contact someone from Crate Entertainment for some additional information about this mysterious game that was never released. Arthur Bruno, the CEO of Crate Entertainment, was really kind to provide me some never seen information about Black Legion and it goes like this. 
after Titan Quest, Iron Lore wanted to try pitching Titan Quest 2 to THQ and also put together a pitch for essentially the same thing but not call Titan Quest to present to other publishers. At the time, publishers felt top-down ARPGs were antiquated and PC gaming was dead. THQ had no interest in Titan Quest 2 because of the slow initial sales, at least partly due to a lack of US marketing. They told us to come back with something new that was multi-platform and they'll consider it. Iron Lore Management then gave me a free reign to come up with my own game and the result was Black Legion. It had a tight third-person camera and more action-oriented fighting system with various brutal finishing moves. It could be compared to Elder Scrolls games but lighter on the RPG, heavier on combat. You assume the role of a member of the Black Legion, an army of conscripted criminals, political dissidents and outcasts who were bound with enchanted colors and sent to war in the name of a doomed empire. Along with more typical RPG questing, we also planned for dynamic battles that would work a bit like Dota heroes, helping creeps progress to capture or destroy objectives. We also had a prototype for a PvP arena match. It was well received by a number of publishers, but the price tag was significant, in part because Iron Lore wanted to overhaul its existing engine to develop the game. THQ was excited about it and greenlit the project. They sent out project managers to go over the milestones with us and then suddenly they dropped the project because they acquired big huge games who were also working on a big budget RPG. That game is obviously Kingdoms of Amalur by the way. We scrambled to secure another publishing deal and it seemed like we got close with Sega but ultimately Iron Law ran out of money before they could close a deal and made the ethical choice to shutter the studio while they still had money to pay severance. Who knows though, maybe we'll resurrect Black Legion someday. I think this is a really interesting piece of history behind Crate Entertainment and Grim Dawn. If Black Legion got released, we probably wouldn't even have Grim Dawn today. However, it seems like Black Legion is not completely off the table. Big thanks to Arthur Bruno for providing this information, by the way. Anyway, shortly after Black Legion failed, Crate Entertainment managed to acquire the license for Titan Quest Engine. And on January 21st, 2010, they announced the name of their new project, Grim Dawn. Shortly after that, they've made a Kickstarter campaign, which was extremely successful. They managed to gather over half a million dollars, which was well beyond their initial goal. Almost two years after the Kickstarter campaign, Grim Dawn came out in early access on Steam and ever since then, it's been supported with new updates almost on a weekly basis. I think this is the prime example of how to gain respect from your fanbase and your supporters. Grim Dawn was in early access for about two years, until it got officially released in February 25th, 2016. And it was received with open arms by the critics and especially the fans. But why? Well, let's dive right in and try to analyze every major feature of this game. As the name of the game would suggest, the story, the setting and the world of Grim Dawn in general is pretty grim which was probably not that easy to pull off because Titan Quest was a really colorful game and almost cartoony actually. So going from Greek mythology to post-apocalyptic setting obviously took a lot of work. Despite the gloomy atmosphere which this game successfully creates, the color palette still remained vibrant although noticeably desaturated. It's still a very colorful game, even though colorful is probably the last word I would use to describe the art style. I just can't generalize the artistic style of this game even if I tried really hard. It's obviously influenced by a lot of different styles, from post-apocalyptic horror fantasy to Lovecraft universe with a little bit of light steampunk theme. That's not the mix of things that I would say it goes well together. Even if it does, it's not something that I would usually enjoy, but it all blends so seamlessly in Grim Dawn. Despite the age of this engine, Grim Dawn looks pretty decent in general and even amazing in some cases. I would say it still holds up pretty good today, especially if you can run it on higher settings. However, that's where the age of this engine can show its ugly face. The performance was always one of the bigger problems which this game had, mostly because Titan Quest engine was reliant on single core CPU performance. Multi-core CPU support was really weak back then, not just when it comes to Titan Quest, so this was nothing unusual. But in 2016 when the game released, and especially today, that technology seems ancient. 
And the worst part about that, it makes me feel ancient, because I played Titan Quest back then, obviously, and things were not so grim like now. That's, that's all I got. Luckily, Crate managed to substantially reduce the performance issues by introducing a 64-bit client. That fixed all the performance issues that I personally had. The game still has occasional micro stutters, but if you have a half-decent PC, you'll be able to run it with no issues. Your frame rate can substantially drop in the endgame when you have a bunch of NPCs on the screen with crazy amount of spell procs and effects. So it's probably not a good idea to try running the highest settings even with a beefy PC just to keep that frame rate well above 60 FPS in those situations. To sum up the graphics parts, I think that Grim Dawn is still a good looking game and I can hardly imagine that someone would refuse to play it because of the graphics. Hell, even Titan Quest that came out in 2006 still looks more than playable. So despite the poor aging of this engine from the technical side, visually it successfully passed the test of time. Crate definitely invested a lot of resources to improve the visuals as much as possible while simultaneously trying to balance the performance of this old engine. We paid a heavy price, but the trap worked. You seem surprised. I'm yet to find a single person who is playing these types of games for the story. If you're one of those people, well, I would like to speak to your parents a little bit. This doesn't mean the story in Grim Dawn is bad, it's actually pretty interesting for a game like this. And it gives you a good enough incentive to keep progressing through the game, which is probably the most important thing. You start the game by creating your character with very limited customization options. That's fine by me because the customization that truly matters in this game is amazing, but we'll get to that. Anyway, your character is possessed by an ethereal spirit, and the people from Devil's Crossing, one of the main hubs in the game, got ready to hang your ass. Right before you were going to die, the spirit leaves your body and conveniently they manage to save you. That's where your adventure begins. You get some starting quests from people in Devil's Crossing and you're free to explore the first chapter of the game. As with pretty much every Diablo-like ARPG, you start off by fighting some zombies. Yeah, original I know. However, enemy variety in Green Dawn is really good, there is no shortage of different looking monsters to fight so don't worry about that. The progression of the story and the gameplay is done in chapters. Each chapter in the game is divided in one huge zone with many different locations to explore. Nothing is stopping you from following the main quest and pushing the story forward, but you can also choose to explore every corner of each map, which I absolutely recommend, especially if you're playing for the first time. I wouldn't go so far to say that side quests are more interesting because they're not. But discovering new NPCs and quests off the beaten path always feels great, and just the exploration itself is amazing. In large part because of the map design, every location is really wide and open with plenty of stuff to find like optional bosses, stories, quests and secrets. It's almost a true open world experience that offers you a lot of freedom with just few limitations. If you're willing to get invested in the story as much as possible, or especially the lore of the game, you can absolutely do that. Besides the info you get in dialogues, there are hundreds of written notes that you can find. One really smart design decision when it comes to these notes is the experience you gain when you first read them, which highly encourages everyone to open them, whether you want to read them or not. Small things like this can show you how much developers care about optional features in the game. What I found particularly enjoyable are the notes with the backstory from some of the elite monsters that you're going to fight, like Getrend for example. So the lore has the depth, it's there if you want it. But let's go back to the main plot of the game. Ethereals are one of the major opposing factions which corrupt the living and cause chaos across the land. They possess humans and animals as well, causing them to mutate into abominations. And while it's usually pretty easy to tell who is under their influence, there are some rare occasions when it's not so obvious. Which means that some people might be affected without having any visible side effects. They use this to create some unexpected story twists throughout the game while interacting with various NPCs. Sometimes it can be predictable if you pay attention. The thing is, arterial corruption is not guaranteed to cause the worst possible effects. It can depend on the mental state of the host. You will meet a couple of NPCs who are noticeably affected by this corruption, but they still remain on the human side. Even the player character has traces of material energy in his body and you can open rift gates because of this. Anyway, you will have some proper choices to make with real consequences which directly affects your gameplay. 
not in a major way, but still enough for you to care. For example, one side quest from the early game will make you choose between two blacksmiths. You can only recruit one of them to join you in Devil's Crossing. There is a slight moral dilemma here that I won't spoil, of course. But from the gameplay perspective, both of these guys offer you different stat bonuses that you have the chance to get on your crafted gear. So yeah, nothing major, but still something to think about. Crate was very consistent with this idea of choices. Besides materials, Grim Dawn has a lot more different factions that you're going to interact with. Some of them are hostile right from the start like Aterials and Catonians, but you will progressively decrease your reputation with them by killing their members. And by doing so, you will simultaneously increase the reputation with some of the friendly factions. And like pretty much everything else in this game, it will affect your gameplay in a couple of ways. Friendly factions will give you access to buy exclusive items, while hostile factions will increase the spawn rate of elite enemies and ultimately start spawning nemesis bosses. A big part of the gameplay loop is related to factions in this game. Actually the whole end game was revolved around grinding reputations and killing these uber bosses. That was a long time ago, the game received some major updates since then. Now it's only one of the things that you can choose to do when you reach the end game. There is one major choice you'll have to make in the story that's related to factions. And you get to do something similar in two major DLCs for the game. To put it simply, decision making in Grim Dawn is by no means a huge feature, but it makes the game feel more like an RPG. And that's a big plus in my book. The story itself? Well, you know how this goes, you have to stop the bad guys from destroying the world. Once you beat the game for the first time, the story becomes irrelevant, like in pretty much every Diablo-like ARPG. So let's talk about the most important thing, the gameplay. These types of games have one of the most repetitive gameplay loop, but developers find a way to make it feel fun and addictive even. Well, the good games in this genre at least. If you don't play a lot of Diablo-like RPGs, you would be surprised how easy it is to completely miss the mark when it comes to the core gameplay features. Even though some features of the gameplay in Grim Dawn are noticeably outdated, like melee animations for example, this studio managed to make the action feel fun. The visual and sound effects in combat are creating a decent feedback for you to not get bored with killing thousands of NPCs over and over again. It's far from the best and the most fluid action that you can experience in this genre, especially compared to some new Diablo-like games, like Last Epoch. However, that's only one of the things that you have to get right in order to create an enjoyable gameplay loop. It's definitely a pretty major factor, but far from being the only one. The limitations that Grim Dawn has on this field are obviously caused by the old Titan Quest engine which the game is using, so they had to work with what they had. An average consumer won't care about that, to be honest, so we have to try and be objective as much as possible. Every now and then I see a couple of comments from people who couldn't get into the game because of the animations or they just didn't like how the gameplay feels and I don't blame them. I personally never had issues like this because I played Titan Quest for so long. And speaking of that, Titan Quest had a very noticeable input lag, I think, or something similar to that which made the gameplay a bit unresponsive. That's one of the things that Crate successfully fixed, so the gameplay immediately felt a lot better to me. Anyway, the feel of the action is something that will keep your attention for a while, but you will get bored easily if there is no real depth behind it or if it's not done properly. Grim Dawn does an amazing job when it comes to this. I already mentioned the two unique mastery system before and that's one of the reasons. You don't start the game by selecting your class, but you get to choose two different masteries at level 2 and level 10 and you are free to invest points from leveling in masteries of your choice. There are 72 different combinations of masteries, if we include the classes from DLCs as well. So saying that you have a lot of options to play the game would be an understatement. Apart from getting your active and passive skills from masteries, you can get a lot of unique skills on items you find. You can even make a whole build around a skill that you found on an item. The thing is, no matter what kind of a build you end up making, it won't be effective in every piece of content which the game offers. Except for maybe a couple of very specific builds. So what kind of content you can expect in Grim Dawn? Well, I'm glad you asked. The game has three difficulties and everything functions like in old school Diablo-like RPGs. 
That means that you have to unlock new difficulties by beating the game. There is also a veteran difficulty that you can turn on when you're playing on normal if you want a greater challenge in the beginning and more experience. The whole normal difficulty was completely rebalanced not so long ago and it feels a lot different than before. It's an old school way of doing difficulties in Diablo-like RPGs, but Green Dawn is a bit specific with this. One of the things that you'll have to pay attention when it comes to basically every character you make is resistances. They don't matter that much on normal difficulty, you can casually play the game and try everything that seems interesting to you and you can beat the game with little to no issues. But if you decide to stick around and reach the true end game, you'll have to pay attention to resistances when you start the elite and especially ultimate difficulty. Luckily, Grim Dawn does an amazing job with itemization, so you can get your resistances from various sources. Sometimes you'll have to sacrifice one of your desirable stats to increase one particular resistance. And just like with every other gameplay feature in Grim Dawn, you always have a lot of different options. Every major gameplay feature is really flexible in Grim Dawn. A couple of things might seem overwhelming to new players, like constellations and these huge stats that you get on higher quality gear. But I don't think you'll have a lot of problems to figure out how everything works, because the game does a good job with character progression. Legendary items only start dropping after level 50, so you'll have a lot of time to get used to the gameplay. One thing I really like when it comes to itemization is how Grim Dawn treats lower quality gear. Unlike in some other Diablo-like RPGs, lower quality items can still be useful even on the highest level. It depends on the RNG gods of course and the system which Grim Dawn uses. For example, green items can roll with a suffix and the prefix, which give you extra stats and active or passive abilities. So even though blue and legendary items are usually more powerful, some green items will be still worth using. That's just a small sample of how the itemization works in this game, but it's a lot deeper than that of course. <clears throat> like Irma, I can say without a doubt that no other game gives me the same feeling when I find a new legendary or some specific item that I was searching for. As if all of this wasn't enough, you also have another crazy layer of depth and that's the constellation system. Path of Exile players will be familiar with this kind of a system. You might be thinking that this is only a passive skill tree, but it's not. Well, it actually is, but you can get some active abilities as well, or to be more specific, procs. If I would have to sum up the gameplay in Grim Dawn with one word, that would be it, procs. Proc or Proc Grand Random Occurrence are basically the spells that can automatically trigger in specific situations. And you can get a ton of them on your character, not only on higher levels. You will get the hang of this in the early game as well. The constellation tree can be a bit confusing at first, but it's actually really simple to use. Although the way you get points for this tree is a little bit annoying sometimes. You'll have to find and cleanse these shrines throughout the world, and each difficulty has a certain amount of them. They are hard to miss, but you'll definitely miss a couple of them here and there. It's not a huge problem, you can always come back to an area and do some more searching or look for some guides online. You might be thinking that you only have those three difficulty modes and you're done with the game. Like I said before, grinding reputations and killing nemesis is only one of the things that you can do in the end game. Besides that, you also have these roguelike dungeons. If you die in these dungeons, you'll have to spend another key that you'll have to make with specific items and start from the beginning. Shattered Realms is another endgame mode that was included in the second expansion for the game. It's basically a randomized endless rift mode. Speaking of that, the Crucible DLC included a classic horde mode. To be honest, I personally don't like it, I prefer to do runs on regular bosses and create my own farming routes. The two major DLCs for the game added a lot more content. You get three new masteries in total and two new chapters. And a lot more of course, the level cap has been increased to 100 and I already mentioned the new Shattered Realms modes. So you have a couple of different options to play the end game and perfect your build. The game really encourages you to make new characters and try out different builds. And with the help of the shared stash, you can easily transfer your items from one character to another. One more major feature which is added after the game released is the transmog system. I have a strong love-hate relationship with this system, not only in Grim Dawn. While it makes the customization that much more extensive, it kinda makes the unique look of items obsolete in a way. However, this service is not cheap at all in Grim Dawn. You will need to spend a lot of iron, which is the currency in the game. 
Don't mistake this for microtransactions, Grim Dawn doesn't have them, thank god. It's a smart way to implement this feature, but like I said, I'm not a huge fan of Transmorg in general. When it comes to other game modes, there are no seasons or leaderboards in the game, but there is a co-op online mode. To be honest, I don't think it's a great co-op mode, I would say that Grim Dawn truly shines in single player. It's the best single player Diablo-like action RPG that you can play, in my opinion. I have to mention the amazing modding scene for this game as well. You can find a lot of quality mods. There's even a whole remake of Diablo 2 in Grim Dawn's engine. Now look, I could talk about the Grim Dawn's gameplay for god knows how long, but we have to draw the line somewhere. You can easily spend hundreds if not thousands of hours playing this game if you end up liking it. It would be a crime not to mention the amazing soundtrack in this game. It's such a good fit for the atmosphere which the game is trying to create. The voice acting is pretty good in this game when you can actually hear the recorded dialogue. You're not looking too bad for someone just come back from the brink of death. You were taken possessed by the same creatures that have been reanimating these zombies here. Most of the main quest NPCs have recorded dialogue lines, but there is a ton of dialogue in the game with no voice acting. This is not surprising at all, hiring good voice actors is one of the most expensive things when you're developing a game. The sound effects are pretty decent as well, like I already mentioned in one part of the video. They were actually really creative while recording sound effects for the game, as you can see in one of the videos on their channel. And that would be it I guess. Tell me your opinions about this game in the comments below. Do you agree or disagree with me and why? Check out the link for Surfshark in the description and don't forget to use my code for the discount. Don't forget to subscribe for more RPG content. If you want to support the channel in the long run, consider becoming a Patreon or a YouTube member. You can get your name on the end credits as well as some other perks like early access to videos, Discord roles, my plans for future content, etc. etc. That will be all, and I'll see you in the next one.